Good evening. This is Donna from the LaSalle Public Library welcoming you to tonight's Zoom program. Before we begin, let me just bring you up to date on future programs. You'll see them on your screen now. Upcoming programs two weeks from tonight on Tuesday, May 4th at 6 p.m. Claire Evans will be back. She's our UK connection uh, with a special program, The Politics of Tea, the East India Company, and the British Tea Culture. This program generated from a, a conversation Claire and I were having. Uh, we happened to have read the same book about the history of tea. And from that, we both just kind of said at the same time, we need a program about that. So I hope you will find it as engaging as we do and can join us on May 4th. Just two days after that on May 6th on a Thursday at seven o'clock, an unusual time for us, we are going to be hosting along with the Westchester Public Library, author, journalist, and filmmaker, Alex Kotlowitz, who will be interviewed by Pulitzer Prize winning Chicago Tribune columnist, Mary Schmidt. Alex is author of the award-winning national bestseller, There Are No Children Here, and also An American uh, Summer, Love and Death in Chicago. Alex has won an Emmy for the 2011 documentary, The Interrupters. Um, finally, Father Dominic will be back, the bread monk, on Saturday, May 8th at one o'clock. Again, an unusual time, so please mark your calendar. And he will be celebrating pizza with his program Beyond Red Sauce and Moss. So we hope we can see you here for all of those programs on Zoom. And more programs uh, will be announced shortly. We have three coming up in addition to these next month. And now for tonight's program, we are welcoming back Lisa Sons. Lisa is the Master Naturalist and IDNR Park Interpreter at Star of Rock and Matheson Park. And is with us tonight to welcome back our spring birds. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and close my microphone. And Lisa, are you there? I am. Hi, everybody. Okay, so let me share my screen. Okay, for those of you that don't know me, I am the Natural Resource Coordinator for Star Rock and Matheson State Parks to the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. I am also a Master Naturalist through the Illinois Extension of the University of Illinois. And some of my favorite pastimes are reflected through my work and through my passion for my work. I am a birder, that is one of my pastimes. And I began birding during one of my first internships right out of college. And that was at Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary in Naples, Florida. And that is a National Audubon Sanctuary. At that time, I knew nothing except birds had wings <laughs> and some very nice volunteers at the sanctuary kind of literally no pun intended took me under their wing and taught me the basics and from there it was like ha a little kid having their first piece of candy I just I couldn't stop and the great thing about birding is that you're always learning something new you're always honing new skills while you're bird watching, whether it's the different types of plumage, different markings for different birds, different bill or beak shapes, um, different breeding or mating behavior, different calls, different songs, there's always something new. And every spring and fall with migration, you're always refreshing yourself because a spring warbler is going to look totally different from a fall warbler because spring is a time of renewal. We're seeing green grasses, we're seeing leaves pop out, flowers 
blooming in our woodlands. And it's also a time where birds are flying back from their winter homes, whether it be Central America, the Caribbean, South America, or the Southern United States. And they're flying back because food sources are available again, warmer temperatures, and they're going to start nesting. Illinois is breeding ground for a lot of bird species. So you're gonna see those bright feathers in a lot of bird species to attract a mate. And Donna and I were talking earlier and she's been noticing the American goldfinches at her feet feeders. And those bright pops of yellow are some of the first breeding plumage that we see this time of year. So to get started, let's talk about those migration routes. So we are part of what is considered the Mississippi Flyway. We're right along the Mississippi River and birds migrating typically follow natural features such as a mountain range like the Rockies or coastline like the Atlantic coast on the Eastern side, Western coast on the California side um, with the Pacific Ocean and then ourselves along the Mississippi River. So we're shown here in green. Now that does not mean that we don't occasionally see a species of bird that should be migrating along say the Atlantic coast end up over here in our side in Illinois. We do get those rare occurrences and a lot of times they just get blown off course through a storm or end up following a different flock. And it's neat to find those rare bird alerts. I follow the Illinois Birding Network on Facebook, and that is a great resource for one, learning birds in the area, two, a network system for meeting other bird birders and learning what different types of birding resources there are, such as joining an Audubon chapter or going on different bird hikes in the area. Okay, I'm gonna hide my screen so you don't have to look at my mug. Okay, so migration wonders. About 40% of the total number of birds in the world migrate. For us, almost 4,000 species of bird migrate every spring and fall. How do they know where to go? Well, have you ever wondered what time birds migrate? When most of us are making our morning and afternoon commutes to and from work, migrating birds are feeding and resting. Many birds migrate during the night. They do this for a variety of reasons. At night, the air is cooler, which eliminates the need to stop as much to cool down in local areas of water. Similarly, similarly at night, there are fewer predators and visibility of these predators is low. Birds are more safe traveling when their predators are resting. This is not the case for all birds as you typically see geese and cranes migrating during the day. How do they know where to go? Birds typically follow the magnetic north. They, they almost have an inner compass built in. And a lot of this is also ingrained um, upon them just from their very first year of migrating with those birds, say in their colony or in their family or even with their own parents. How do they know when to leave? Different triggers such as food sources becoming less and less available. Say a bird like the Eastern Meadowlark is heavily dependent upon insects for a food source. And as winter approaches, those insects are dying off or going beneath the ground to hibernate over the winter. So that kind of sends a signal to the Meadowlark, time to migrate, head further south where they can find a food source. How far do birds travel during migration? Birds in migration can travel as far as 16,000 miles. 
To reach their destination in time, some travel at speeds of 30 miles per hour. At this speed, birds take up to 533 hours to reach their final destination. Traveling eight hours a day, it would take some birds 66 days to reach their migration destination. This means the birds have been traveling a long time by the time they get to your backyard. Make sure they are welcomed with fresh food and water when they arrive. This is why it's very important to provide native habitat by planting those native plants, native shrubs. Don't be, um, I mean, you can put out your hummingbird feeders. I usually on the Star Rock and Matheson Facebook pages that I manage, I put out a map that tracks hummingbird migration because we do get a lot of questions at the park. When should I put out my feeders? So I've already put my feeders out at both the park and here at home about a week ago. They've been out for a week. Not all birds travel low where we can see them. Some birds travel in altitude as high as 500 to 2,000 feet. Geese and vultures have been known to travel at altitudes of 29,000 to 37,000 feet. Some scientists believe that birds travel at higher altitudes to conserve energy with less flapping of the wings and more gliding. They move up and down altitudes to gain boosts of natural lift from the changes in density. Migration May, or at least that's what I like to call it. Um, we actually have our spring bird count coming up on Saturday, I think it's May 8th or May 9th. And we have been getting reports of warblers already coming into the area. I know a lot of folks have already been spotting the yellow rumped warbler. And then I've also already spotted Louisiana water thrushes in our canyons at the park. They like that drip, drip, drop of some of the, the smaller little falls coming off of the side of the sandstone walls. So some travel hazards. Um, oh, actually before that, it is estimated that 3 million birds cross the Illinois-Wisconsin state border daily as they migrate back to their northern homes. And if, if you're one of those that like to follow the weather radar or weather Doppler online, it can at times pick up heavy bird migrations. And sometimes even the Illinois Birding Network will post those migrations. And usually they're gonna happen either before or right after a storm front comes through. On heavy migration days, there can be as many as 30 million birds migrating into Wisconsin during the spring season. So they are traveling up through Illinois. And if you catch it just on the right day, you can catch some of those northern species. As mentioned earlier, birds migrate during certain times of the day to avoid potential threats. Their biggest threats on the long journey home in the spring include predators like owls or hawks, dehydration, starvation, actually oil drilling rigs in the ocean, windmills, power stations, and drastic climate changes. All of these hazards are instinctually taken into consideration, but birds are still not completely safe during their journey. Birds migrating from neotropic areas, such as Central America and South America, um, that are considered neotropic migrators include the Northern Oriole, the Baltimore Oriole, the Indigo Bunting, the Rose-breasted Grosbeak, pictured here, and the Ruby-throated Hummingbird. Most important thing to remember is that birds need food, water, and nesting materials. They are gonna be very hungry after exerting energy to travel those long distances. They could be facing dehydration if they don't drink enough water after finishing their migration flight and they will be ready to lay their eggs. They'll be looking for that nesting material. By providing nesting materials in your yard, like I know a lot of us might've seen on Pinterest where you can put yarn or string out in suet feeders for them to gather. I don't recommend that because reports have come in of that actually tangling up young birds within the nest since those aren't natural materials. So if you just 
put out some cut grasses if you have long grasses on your property, um, leaves and some twigs, or they've been around a long time. They kind of know what to do. So if you have those native shrubs and native trees in your area, they'll, they'll work with what they have. Hungry birds. So now we can actually talk about what type of food to put out if you haven't already put out feeders. Here at home, we put out wild bird seed, which you can see in the upper left-hand corner. And it has a mix of different seed. Um, it has sunflower seeds, safflower seeds, millet, sometimes corn and corn pieces will be in it as well. Sometimes niger seed um, will be in there which is type of thistle. And that will attract a, a variety, a diversity of different birds, including house finches, purple finches, cardinals, um, nut hatches, things like that. Black oil sunflower, which is pictured on the upper right, is another common seed to put out. And this will attract those birds that have the heavy conical beaks like the cardinal or the nut hatch that will crack open the seeds to get into the nut inside. Niger seed, which is um, used to attract finches. Finches, especially the American goldfinch, enjoy niger seed. You can buy it in the socks that you can hang or you can buy it in a bag to fill special feeders for finches. Suet, you can buy the seed cakes that are already placed together in a loaf to place in the suet feeder. And we'll show feeders here in a second. Nectar. So there are some very simple recipes out for making your own nectar. And I actually recommend those. And I did post one last week with the hummingbird map or a couple of weeks ago on the Star Rock and Matheson Facebook pages. You wanna stay away from the store-bought hummingbird food. It, it contains a red dye and their kidneys just cannot pro, um, process that red dye and it's actually harmful to them. And, it, and it's actually honestly very simple to make your own nectar at home. It's just four cups of water to one cup of sugar heated and stirred, just think let your stir and Kool-Aid. Place it in a container in the fridge and then the next day you can fill your feeders. Um, you don't want to keep it in your fridge for much longer than three days to a week. And you just want to make sure you're cleaning those figures, those feeders regularly, especially during those hotter summer days. Grape jelly and oranges will attract red-bellied woodpeckers, your Baltimore Orioles, your Orchard Orioles, and even your rose-breasted grosbeaks. But again, look at customer reviews on the different grape jelly feeders. There are a few out there that actually I don't recommend because the bird has to go further into the jar or the opening to get the grape jelly, the more it goes down, and that can cause some damage. Um, to their feathers. Sometimes they might be able to get caught in there. So I don't recommend those type of feeders. And you can always email me at the park too if you have a question on one of them. There's also quite a few things on Pinterest where you can build your own Oriole feeder where you can place the oranges out or even cuties, nectarines or tangerines. My husband actually built ours here at, here at home. So hanging feeders, and yes, I know this picture is basically what not to do. They've got the red coloring in here, but this is one I got online. I didn't take my own picture. I should have from the park. Hummingbird feeders, you've got a suet feeder here with a downy hanging off of it, eating the suet cake. Down below, you've got an Oriole feeder. And then you have a black oil sunflower or they could even put a wild bird mix in here in the feeder on the right, a hanging feeder, or they've actually also built this up on a pipe to be a stationary feeder. So just look at your different options for feeders online for your backyard.
It's basically your preference. The one thing to remember in spring is that they're hungry and they're coming in and they need food. And sometimes even with our wacky weather, hence today, wacky weather in Illinois, they, they don't always have a readily available native or natural source. So that's why it is important to have those bird feeders out if you're able to. Some things to keep in mind for your backyard if you're able to, or even if you work within your community, maybe you help keep up a neighborhood park in your community. Some bird needs cover and shelter. So say you're gonna put a hummingbird feeder up, you're not gonna to wanna to put it up in the middle of your lawn where there's no trees or shrubs for shade or shelter. Water source, if you don't have a creek or a river or a lake or a pond nearby, it doesn't have to be directly in your yard, but nearby within the community, um, within a couple of, you know, like a mile or two miles, then it's a good idea to have a water source, such as a bird bath. And you just wanna make sure you keep that bird bath clean of mold, and algae. And also you want to make sure it's not too deep of a bird bath. And here at home, we actually put a rock, a limestone flagstone in the middle of our bird feeder, and that kind of gives them a, a perching ground. And then natural food sources. So pictured here is one of the native honeysuckles, and this is actually a great source of nectar for hummingbirds coming in. Um, and then also seeds like the prairie or the purple coneflower pictured on the upper left hand corner when that goes to seed for a lot of different birds. All right, now we'll start talking about our birds. Okay, so some of the first birds that I always look for in spring are the turkey vultures returning. You can always notice by that V formation in their wing span. I get a lot of questions at the park um, when folks think that they have seen a possible eagle, but it didn't look right. The head didn't look like it had feathers. And then I ask them about the wings. Were the wings linear straight out or were they up like a V? And when they say up like a V, I tell them think V for vulture, turkey vulture. Turkey vultures are goose sized or larger. Fun fact, well, it might be fun for some of you, but not for all of you. They will defecate on their feet to beat the heat. Can you imagine if humans did that? That would be gross. They will also throw up if they feel someone or something is crowding them or chasing them. So they really <laughs> don't have much etiquette or manners <laughs> for the bird world. Their head is feather free, and this is an adaptation to prevent bacteria buildup since they are carrion eaters and their heads can get quite messy while eating. Turkey vultures in the Southern United States stay year round while their Northern counterparts migrate to the Southern United States down into Mexico and South America. Now there is another species of vulture in the Southern United States called the black vulture. And those are a little bit smaller than the turkey vulture. Let me hear their call. So it sounds like someone tearing a piece of paper, right? It's, it's a hissing noise. Next, we have one of my favorite birds. This is the Eastern Meadowlark. And I just, I don't know, it's, it's a good omen to me when I can spot an Eastern Meadowlark on my way to work. I live in Tonica, somewhat out in the country, and I have to follow um, the Tonica Blacktop to Route 178 through Lowell by the Vermilion River to get to work. And I always look for Eastern Meadowlark along the fence lines or telephone lines. And if I see one in the morning in spring, I just think that's going to be a great day because I saw a metal art. And then if you get a chance to get out to the Matheson Vermilion River area at Matheson State Park, you can hear 
the meadow larks calling. I was out there last Thursday for our Earth Day in the Parks program with Lad Grade School, and the meadow larks were just, they were chanting up a storm. And I'll play their call for you. So some folks think there's different mnemonic devices or ways to remember a call. And with the Eastern Meadowlark, some say it sounds like spring is here. Um, and that wasn't very loud. So let me pull it up on my phone app and play it again for you. So you might get something entirely different from it than spring is here. <laughs> um, they measure about the size of a robin, a little bit larger, and they do have that bright yellow chest with the black little apron or bib. Fun fact, it gets its name meadowlark because it sings prettily like a lark. It also inhabits open areas as a lark does. The song of the meadowlark sounds like spring is here or see you, see your. I like spring is here. Resident to short distance migrant, although some birds from northern populations migrate more than 600 miles to the southern US. These migrating meadowlarks typically depart by the end of November for wintering areas and return to the north after the snow melts in the spring. Next up is a very common bird that I know most people will identify with in regards to spring, and this is the red-winged blackbird. The red-winged blackbird, I, I like to refer to it as the extrovert of the bird world. They are loud, and they know it, and they're going to show it. And we hear them throughout the park and even here at home, and I never, I never tire of it. And I, I love teaching little kids when they're out of the park how to sound like different birds by using different words. So the red-winged blackbird, if you say conclary, it sounds similar to their call. And I'll play it for you. And this is the male pictured here. A fun fact, for some people, the raspy conclary of the red-winged blackbird is a sign of spring. It is for me. Males are almost all black with bright red and yellow wing epaulets. Forget mating for life, males of this species can't commit. They juggle as many as 15 female mates. Resident or short distant migrant, red-winged blackbirds in Northern North America winter in the Southern United States as far as about 800 miles from their breeding ranges. Southern in some Western populations do not migrate at all. All right, so the indigo bunting, my husband's favorite bird. He, he loves these little flashes of blue and he waits for them every spring and we almost have a little competition here at home. Who's gonna see the indigo buntings first in the backyard? And since he's retired and I'm still working, he basically wins the competition anymore every spring. So indigo bunting, they're about the size of a sparrow, if not a little bit smaller. Fun fact, they're actually black. The diffraction of light through their feathers makes them look blue. This explains why males can appear many shades from turquoise to black. They are more common now than when the pilgrims first landed. This is due to an increase in their favorite habitat of woodland edges, such as power line clearings and along roads. They migrate at night using the pattern of stars nearest the North Star to guide them. In captivity, these birds will become disoriented if they can't see the stars. They migrate to Southern Florida and Northern South America, distances of up to 1200 miles. 
And we do get these at Star Rock. I typically see them actually on top of the rock or in areas like our overlooks in the trees around Lover's Leap or Eagle Cliff. So I always listen for that sweet, 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 sweet. I feel like they're saying sweet in that high pitch. And it does sound similar to finches. Next up, and I know a lot of us wait for and anticipate the arrival of the Baltimore Oriole. That vibrant yellow orange with a mixture of the black and the white on the back. And we have several nests at the park. And I tell you, if they were human, they would not do well as a real estate agent or a construction worker building homes because some of their bell-shaped nests are hanging nests and they literally build them right over the park road. And if you've ever been to Star Rock, you know how busy it gets. We get about 3 million visitors a year. So I just don't think they're thinking about when they build their nest that they're building it directly over a busy road. Um, usually they look for water sources and will build their nests anywhere from 15 feet or higher up over a water source. We can always hear their calls later in the spring, usually around the first or second week of May is when I start hearing them first at the park and then spotting them. And they love that woodland edge right behind the visitor center and just below the Star Rock Lodge. So they have a bright and cheery call, but it, it's, it's garbled, almost like they have cotton balls in their mouth while they're trying to sing. So to me, it, it just reminds me of a Robin's call, but where Robin is more clear with cheerio, cheery up, cheery me, the Oriole just sounds like it slurs its words together. It is Robin sized. And some fun facts, five fruits that you'll often see them munching on are raspberries, crab apples, grapes, mulberries, and cherries. So if you're thinking of doing landscaping in your yard, I know during COVID last year, so many people were trying to get a hold of different plants and trees and shrubs because more people were staying home and want to do some landscape work or garden work. And I know the same is for this year because my husband and I have been out trying to find different native bushes and a lot of places are sold out. But you can look for things like choke cherries, mulberries. I know not everyone wants a mulberry in their yard, especially if you're going to plant it where it could possibly stain something like a sidewalk or a driveway or the house. Uh, but they are beneficial. Crab apples and then raspberries. If you have a patch next to a garden and you want to plant raspberries or blackberries. The Baltimore Oriole actually winters in Florida and Central America. It migrates north starting in late winter, arriving in the southeast throughout April to begin mating and nesting. And that's the southeast. So give it a couple more weeks to a month for us. So around that, that beginning of May to mid-May, depending on the weather. Next up is rose-breasted grosbeak. And I usually find the rose-breasted grosbeak right alongside mixed into the same area and same habitat as the Orioles. And they have that very pronounced conical bill. Just think of a pair of pliers. They have a very strong bill for the different types of food that they eat. They are about the size of a robin, a little bit smaller. The male rose-breasted grosbeak actually shares incubation duties with the female and is known to even sing while sitting on the nest. So he's a pretty good dad. The rose-breasted grosbeak is beneficial for farmers consuming many potato beetles and weed seeds. They are a long-distance migrant. 
They fly from North American breeding grounds to Central and Northern South America. Most of them fly across the Gulf of Mexico in a single night, although some migrate over land around the Gulf. And they have a very pretty call as well. Okay, so some of the phone calls that I receive in summer, whether it's from fellow park staff, volunteers, or the public hiking the trail is, I saw this red bird and it was, it was low, it was in the shrubs and I couldn't get a very good look at it, but it was bright red. I usually know spot on that they've seen a scarlet tanager. We do get quite a few of the scarlet teenagers, usually on the bluff trails higher up above the canyons where you're going down the staircases and you're in an upper area where the creek is flowing up and over those canyon walls forming the waterfalls. And they're usually mixed in along the shrubs in that area such as bladder nuts and eastern wahoos and some of the pawpaws and unfortunately some of the bush honeysuckle. And if you're lucky enough, you can catch that flash of red or one of my coworkers actually sent me a picture and he was able to get a nice shot of the bird showing the red with the black wings. They are, again, size between a sparrow and a robin. They you can basically attract them to your own yard if you have a nice woodland edge with suet or mealworms. You can buy mealworms at your local pet stores, your local bait shops. Great jelly or oranges will also attract them in. And their song, I think sounds like a robin with a case of a sore throat. So let's see what you think. Now, when they're singing, they do not move around much. So if you really tune in to the song of a Scarlet Tanager and you're out hiking, if you hear that, focus on that sound and focus where it's coming from with your binoculars and you should be able to see it. it it'll sing from a perch. It will not move around while it's singing. Next up is a Summer Tanager. And summer tanagers, depending on their age, can actually look different colors. So the younger tanager, year, two years old, could actually look more yellow and quite different of a bird to where sometimes birders question if they're really seeing what they're seeing. So this bird here is in transition because when a summer teenager is fully grown, an adult male will look bright red, almost like a cardinal, bright red. The female will be bright yellow. So this is actually an immature male. He has a little bit of yellow and a little bit of red going on. So he's slowly changing. Now the summer teenager is gonna be the same size between a sparrow and a robin, like the scarlet. And they actually can catch insects such as bees in flight. And then they kill it by beating it against a branch. Before eating it, the tanager removes the stinger by rubbing it on a branch. A group of tanagers are collectively known as a season of tanagers. It'd be pretty neat to watch that kind of behavior. Here's their call. Okay, next up is the orchard oriole. I have had orchard orioles before in the past in my yard. And then I have also had them at the park, specifically at Lone Point Shelter and the woodland edges there 
along the Illinois River. And they are going to be the same size as a Baltimore Oriole, so they are going to be roughly the size of a robin. They are actually the smallest North American Oriole. It is a late spring migrant, but it heads back southward quickly. Some Orioles may return to their winter grounds as early as mid-July. So blink and you miss it. Probably arrives you know, early June and then could be gone by July again. And I've only spotted them once at the park and that was, that was June actually of 2018 down at Lone Point Shelter. Okay, so now on to what I like to call the birds that you usually hear first before you spot them. Because vireos, at least to me personally, do not sit still. So I usually hear the red-eyed vireo most often at the park while I'm hiking. I try to concentrate if I'm leading a tour because my, my bird side of my brain is like, oh, I hear a red-eyed vireo, where is it? And then the professional side of my brain is, no, you're talking about the park, you're leading a guided tour, you're not bird watching. So the red-eyed vireo is going to be smaller than a sparrow. And yes, they do have a red appearance to their eye, can't really see it that well in this picture. And they'll have that black eye streak through their eye, and then this black cap up above. So as you can tell, they are chatterboxes. And it's just like constant during this time of year when they, when they come in because they're trying to attract a mate, they're trying to build a nest, trying to raise a family. So some fun facts, they forage in deciduous canopies where they can be difficult to find among the green leaves. Hence why I said you're gonna hear them first before you see them. They're carefully scanning those leaves actually for their favorite prey, which are caterpillars. The males are among the most persistent singers of all birds and have been recorded singing more than 10,000 songs a day in spring. Maybe they should join one of those singing contests if they're singing that much. A group of red-eyed vireos are collectively known, you're gonna like this, as a hangover of vireos. Yeah, that's right. Next up is the white-eyed vireo, and you can see from this picture, they have a clear white eye ring. And they'll have this buff yellow coloration, black and white wing stripes. And this was actually one of the first birds that I learned to spot by its call. And when I worked in Florida, the volunteer, one of the volunteers that took me underneath their wings, uh, he was of the name Mac. And he actually gave me my first pair of binoculars because he was buying a new pair. So he gave me his old pair. And Mac told me to listen for eat your Cheerios quick. That's how he remembered the call of the white eyed vireo. We'll see what you think. So you make what you want out of that. If you hear eat your Cheerios or eat your Cheerios quick, that works. <laughs> That's what works for me. Another fun fact about this Vireo, it's that white eye ring. You can refer to it as yellow spectacles surrounding its white eye. Young birds have a dark eye that turns white in their first winter or spring. They winter from the southern Gulf Coast to Central America and from coastal North Carolina, the Bahamas and Bermuda to the Caribbean. 
The white-eyed vireo is one of only two perching birds in the U.S. with white eyes. The other, the wren tit, is only found in the westernmost part of the country. Unfortunately, some of the vireo numbers are declining. This is mainly due to this bird is typically sought out or their nests are sought out by the brown-headed cowbird. Brown-headed cowbirds are a type of parasitic bird where it is brood parasitism, which means that they're gonna lay an egg within that vireo or warbler nest. That egg is larger and it's gonna outcompete once it's hatched those smaller hatchlings. And then that bird, such as the white-eyed vireo, isn't necessarily gonna recognize that that baby brown-headed cowbird isn't one of its own. Next up is the yellow-throated vireo, and we do get those as well at the park. They're spiral sized or smaller. Males and females look as if they are wearing bright yellow spectacles on their olive green head. So they're gonna have more of a greenish to tan tinge there on their back and head. Males sing a burry 3-8. So let's see what you make of that. These birds migrate to the deep southern United States, Mexico, the Caribbean, and Central America. Here in their breeding habitat, they prefer deciduous woods, such as the oak and hickory forest that we have here at the park. All right, so some of the common finches that you will find around your feeders. We have the American goldfinch, that black cap, or actually looks like a little black toupee to me, and the bright yellow with the black wings. They are gonna be sparrow sized or smaller. They are the only finch that molts its body feathers twice a year, once in late winter and again in late summer. The brightening yellow of male goldfinches each spring is one welcome mark of approaching warm months. American goldfinches breed later than most North American birds. I actually find quite a few goldfinch nests out at the Matheson Vermilion River area. And usually it's in winter when the prairie is no longer in bloom and there's no leaves out on the small trees, but they like to gather the long grasses and even the fluff from milkweed pods or thistle to build their nests. And it's a small little cup-like nest that I usually find between some of the woodland edge branches or even on some of the sturdier plant stalks in the prairie. It is migratory and it ranges from mid Alberta to North Carolina during the breeding season and from just south of Canada, United States border to Mexico during the winter. It is irregular in migration with more remaining in North in winters with good food supply. Peak migration is usually mid fall and early spring, but some will actually linger south of nesting range to late spring or early summer. This is one of those species that actually migrates during the day. Oh, wait, before I get into the call. So American goldfinch, I always feel like they're saying potato chips, potato chips, potato chips. Maybe it's because I just want a snack uh, potato chips, or maybe it really does sound like that, but I'll leave it up to you. They have that bright and cheery call, and you do have to remember one thing about bird calls is that just like humans, Everyone has a different tone or pitch of voice. Birds are gonna sound different. So there's different calls, like an alarm call or a call to a mate or a call to young. And there's different songs. So a breeding song, again, to attract a mate. 
So they're going to have different vocalizations. The house finch and this and the purple finch were actually two finches that were pretty hard for me in the beginning when I first started birding to differentiate between. And the house finch you'll notice does not have as much of the red on its body, just has what I call a dusting. And the dusting comes down to just a little bit of a bib and then around its head, as opposed to the purple finch, which looks like it literally took a swim in some raspberry jam. So the house finch, So again, finches have that very, what I think is a bright and cheery call. And house finches are one of the most adaptable of the finches where you will see them commonly in places like city parks, backyards, urban centers, farms, forest edges, all over the continent. In the Western US, you'll also find house finches in their native habitats of deserts, grassland, and open woods. So they're very adaptable species. The purple finch, again, a very pretty bird. I know a lot of people get excited when they think they've seen a purple finch and then it ends up being a house finch, but I think they're both equally pretty. Male purple finches are actually delicate pink red on the head and breast mixing with brown on the back and cloudy white on the belly. Female purple finches have no red. And most of the time in, in bird species, the female is going to be more of a, what I call camouflaged color. So they're gonna come in colors of grays, tans, browns, some streaking or stripes. And this is to help them camouflage and blend in because their sole responsibility is protecting the brood, protecting the nest and raising the young. So they're not gonna want those flashy colors that might attract a predator. Purple finches will actually readily come to your feeders, especially if you put out black oil sunflower seeds. They are erratic migrants that follow cone crops. So if you had joined us this past fall for the bird talk, we had talked about finch eruptions. These are one of those species that you will see more of them because they're following the cone crops. So they're following the different coniferous species, hemlocks, um, different pines, things like that for the cones and the seeds in the cones. So typically they leave Canadian breeding grounds to winter widely across central and southeastern U.S., returning to specific regions roughly every other year. Birds that breed in northeastern U.S. and along the Pacific coast may not migrate. And we'll play that call. Okay, another one of my favorites. And if you if you venture into Star Rock this time of year, all the way throughout August, you're going to most likely spot an Eastern Bluebird, especially along the south entrance off of Route 71, because you drive through our prairie. And we do have a Bluebird box trail through that area, as well as at Matheson, the Vermilion River area. And they have another garbled type of call that is, is pretty unique to them. So I do listen for this call this time of year. And you will most likely see them perching more so than flying. And you'll see them perching on fence posts, fence wires, on top of the bluebird boxes themselves or lower on branches about five to 10 feet up from the ground. 
they are a cavity dweller. So they used to utilize, you know, old trees along a woodland edge that had maybe old woodpecker holes in them or, you know, rotted out fence posts along a farmer's field. And they were actually a farmer's friend. Um, they are an insectivore, so their, their diet is insects. And at one time, birdhouses were actually encouraged around smaller fields, you know, several hundred years ago, because farmers knew that birds like the bluebird would actually help control pests on their crops. And then we move further and further away from that, depending on science for different chemicals and pesticides. And unfortunately, those pesticides might not kill off all of those harmful pests and the bluebird might still go after those pests and then it travels up the food chain. They are native to North America and they're only found in North America. And there's actually several species of bluebirds within North America. We see the Eastern bluebird here. Occasionally we'll see a Western and occasionally on rare incident, people will see a mountain bluebird that comes this far East. They're mentioned in a lot of popular songs. I know everybody's probably seen Wizard of the Oz, Somewhere Over the Rainbow mentions the bluebirds. And we actually have quite a few that overwinter here at the park. When I do the winter bird count, I usually find a good sized group of them hanging out in the horseback campground in the shelter of some of the trees there. And there's a nice little creek that runs through there as well. So they will alter their diet from insects to more along the lines of berries and buds on trees in the winter to survive. American Robin, I know this is the first sign of spring for a lot of us. And Robins actually will overwinter as well. I think I had about 40 of them on my count at Matheson for the bird count this winter. That's that cheerio, cheery up, cheery me. So when talking about most bird species, you compare them in size to other common species. So throughout this discussion, I've been comparing birds to the size of either a goose or a sparrow or a robin. But then you're probably like, well, then what is the size of a robin? Typical rule of thumb, your adult hand. So the size of an adult hand from the bottom of your palm up to the tip of your, your middle finger. That's, that's my rule of thumb. No pun intended. House wren. So my mother-in-law used to call these Jenny wrens. And I wish I would have asked her why. If anyone knows why, please send me a message. I know a lot of these old time names, you know, come from farmers or their observations because she's called kestrels, sparrow hawks, and red-tailed hawks, she's called chicken hawks. And you know when the house wrens have arrived because they are chatterboxes as well. And they will chatter first thing in the morning with those robins and they will chatter last thing at night before the sun goes down. They are extremely territorial and they like to invade nest boxes as well. They are cavity dwellers and they will build a nest of loose sticks stacked high up like they like a little high rise. And sometimes they will actually even build on top of a chickadee nest or a bluebird nest because I've found that happen here at home in my own bluebird boxes. They are actually gonna be smaller than a sparrow and they are another insectivore. So they are cleaning up some of those insects in the yard such as leaf hoppers, springtails, beetles, spiders. And they actually head south during the month of September and October. So they're an early migrator. 
And if you ever get a nest on your wreath in your front door on the light by your front door, it's usually either gonna be a robin, a house sparrow, or this little guy, the house wren. Sometimes it'll even be the house finch. All right, some of our warblers. We do get quite a few species of warblers at the park, especially along our canyon creeks. One of my favorite spots to go birding in the spring, specifically in the month of May, is down near Illinois Canyon, Kaskaskia Canyon, and Ottawa Canyon. That usually seems to be where I have the most luck. Or if I walk along the i &M Canal from Utica to Buffalo Rock or Utica towards LaSalle. So first up is the yellow warbler. It's gonna be smaller than a sparrow. That bright yellow with the rusty streaks on its chest. You can hear that tweet, 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 tweet. It's like a little canary. And the yellow warbler, fun fact, you're gonna look for these on the tops of tall shrubs and small trees. Warblers are a true test of patience. <laughs> There's still moments, and I've been birding for 24 years, there's still moments where I get the knots in my stomach and I just want to give up because I can hear them, but they never sit still. They're like the teenagers of the bird world. They never sit still. So it's really hard to get your eyes on a warbler. And then as soon as you get your eyes on them and you're starting to find those telltale marks, they move. And so then you have to look for them all over again or hope you can look for them all over again. Again, they are an insectivore, and the reason why they're always restless and moving is because they are looking for insects along those treetops. So they're gleaning things like caterpillars and other larvae off of the leaves and twigs. They migrate to mangrove forests each winter in Central and South America. Next one is one of my favorites because of their telltale song. And I wanna play the song for you first. This is the Northern Perula. And they're this pretty bluish gray with the yellow breast. And then they have almost a brown, black, sometimes rusty colored patch here, like a little apron or bib. That's not giving a very clear song. I'm going to play a different song for you because that one didn't record very loud. Here's another one. So they have that buzzing that that escalates gets higher and at the end they have that clear crisp note. So zeet. And that's one of my favorites that I always listen for in the month of May or early June. And then you can usually track them down by listening for that call. Some neat fun facts about them. They are very vocal during spring migration. In the southern part of their range, northern perulas are more common in deciduous forests, but in the northern part, they also use evergreen forests. The key to their presence is moss. They need moss for their nesting sites. So they're looking for moss. And this is probably why I find them quite a bit around the canyons because of that moss growing off of the sandstone. Next one up is one of my favorites, but I know some people might think of them as a nuisance. Yellow-bellied sapsucker. And just like its name, I love birds that have a direct and straightforward name because underneath these buff feathers, there's actually a yellow tinge. You can see some of it right here by its bib and they suck sap. So it's as simple as that. Whoever named this bird was pretty straightforward. And I call them the OCD bird of the bird world because their holes to tap sap are very linear, almost like the keys on a keyboard. 
So if you ever come across a tree on your hike or in your backyard and you see those very linear holes, not like a big sloppy hole in one area and then you know a foot down another hole like a pileated woodpecker you know these are tiny holes straight across and then drop down about a couple inches in another row of holes and they do this so the sap can drain down and then they can drink that sap So definitely does not sound like your typical woodpecker. They are robin sized. They are short to long distant migrant. They actually depart their breeding range in September and early October for wintering grounds in the southern US, Mexico, West Indies, and Central America. Then they arrive back north in May. Okay. Next up, and I've already seen and heard both of these, the Eastern Wood Peewee and the Eastern Phoebe. I haven't spotted yet the Ruby-throated Hummingbird, but I know others have spotted them already in our area of Illinois. So what I like about the Wood Peewee and the Eastern Phoebe is they say their name. So again, simple, straightforward names. And you can tell by both the way that they're perching and their tails, they are part of the flycatcher family. So they are insectivores. Hear that pee-a-wee. And again, sparrow size are smaller. The Eastern Wood Peewee is actually one of the last spring migrants to return from its wintering range in South America. Most individuals migrate over land through Mexico, but some cross the Caribbean. Eastern Wood Peewees are sit and wait predators that will wait out on their perches for insects and then grab the insect from the air and return back to their perch to eat it. Okay, let's head on over to the Eastern Phoebe. Again, says its name. Phoebe. So again, they are pretty active, but they will make short flights to capture insects and then come back to their perch to dine on that insect. When perched, one of the distinctive ways to tell if it's a peewee or a phoebe is that the phoebe will wag its tail. Not bob it, it'll like wag it, shake it back and forth. Peewee or phoebes will actually favor open woods such as yards, parks, woodlands, and woodland edges. So you'll most likely hear a Phoebe in your own backyard if you have some wood, wood, woodland edge or some shrubs and trees in your backyard. A ruby-throated hummingbird, sometimes you actually hear the beat of their wings before you actually hear their chatter. So here you can hear both the beat of their wings and their chatter in the background. Ruby-throated hummingbirds are bright emerald or golden green on the back and crown with gray-white underparts. Males have that brilliant iridescent red throat that looks dark when it's not in good lighting. Ruby-throated hummingbirds fly straight and fast but can stop instantly, hover and adjust their position up, down, or backwards with exquisite control because of those specialized wings. They often visit hummingbird feeders and tube-shaped flowers, such as that native honeysuckle, and defend these food, resor food resources against others. So when you put your feeders out later in the fall before migration, you will notice the young, the juvenile hummingbirds fighting over those feeders. They will defend them like, I, I don't think they learned how to share. You know, we all have to learn how to share when we were in preschool or younger, but I don't think they'll ever learn that lesson 
So it's almost like when I watch them fighting over the feeders here at home, I just imagine them when they're their high pitched call saying, mine, mine, it's mine, it's all mine. They do winter in Southern Mexico, southward across Central America to Panama. Smaller numbers spend their winter in the West Indies. All right, the great crested flycatcher. So this is another one of my first birds when I worked in Florida. There was, this is another cavity nester. So they look for old woodpecker holes and build their cavity down and into that tree. And there was a nest off of the boardwalk at Quartz Response Sanctuary that we could observe the flycatchers and then their young. And they have this telltale yellow breasts. They're about the size of a robin and they got this buff color, like almost like a mohawk. And they have this very distinctive reep that, that is just very loud, like, hello, I'm here. And we have one here at home in our backyard, but I have yet to find the nesting cavity. But I always wait to listen for them, oops, to return. And here's that, I think this was the Veep one, I'll play for you. Loud Veep. So some neat things about the Great Crested Flycatcher, they again, just like that wood peewee, the flycatcher family, they are sit and wait predators. They'll sit from their high perches, usually near the tops of trees and look for those larger insects, such as your dragonflies, your mayflies, things like that. And then they'll return to the same or a nearby perch with their food. All breeding populations north of Central Florida winter in Central and Southern Florida, Southern Mexico, Central America, and Northwestern South America. They typically leave their Northern breeding grounds, which is us, in September and begin to return to the Southern United States in mid-March. They tend to migrate alone, so they won't migrate with other birds. Gray catbird, I've been listening and I haven't heard any just yet or seen any, but usually they're around at the same time the brown thrasher is coming back. And I have been hearing the brown thrasher here in our backyard. So the catbird, another one, that is named because of its sound. So it literally sounds like a cat. And you'll hear that here in a second. I don't know where my cursor went, there it goes. Okay, so that's one call, let me do the other call for you. That's the cat one, the meow. So again, name for its color. It is gray, robin sized. Some will have this darker gray or black cap on top of their head. And they like, an understory. So they like smaller shrubs. Um, they'll stay within those smaller shrubs for protection, flitting in and out for food. They are pretty secretive, so you don't see them until you hear them. Singing males will sit atop shrubs and small trees. They are reluctant to fly across open areas because of predators. Look for great catbirds in dense tangles. So I mentioned those shrubs and small trees along streamside thickets or old fields. They do migrate to Southern areas of the United States, Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean for the winter. Next, the brown thrasher. And the brown thrasher is robin size, just a tad bit bigger than a robin. And they have this beautiful rusty brown color with these speckled spots here in the front. And again, they're gonna like that understory shrub layer as well, just like the catbird. 
And sometimes you'll actually find these guys out in the open on the ground, like a robin or a northern flicker looking for insects and such on the ground. So they can actually copy other bird songs and they'll string them together. So if you hear a bird that doesn't seem to have like a clear song, almost like it's a chatterbox and it's doing a re repetition of different calls mixed in together, look around and most likely you're gonna find that brown thrasher. They are a short distance partial migrant. And in the winter, brown thrashers move out of the Northern part of their breeding range and into the Southeastern region where resident thrashers also stay year round. Some northern birds move southwest into central Texas outside of the normal breeding range. All right, so some of the resources that I recommend and that I use quite often when I'm either writing an article or putting together a presentation or a program is a National Audubon website, www.audubon.org. Um, also, I belong to the Star Rock Audubon, and I also follow the JWP Audubon on Facebook, and I'm a member of the Illinois Audubon, and they do send out a magazine, and there's actually quite a bit of resources on their website as well. The Illinois Audubon also in coordination with um, the Illinois Raptor Center and Ameren put on the Eagle Watch weekend at Star Rock every year, but of course it didn't happen this year because of COVID. My phone, so a lot of the calls on this presentation came from the Merlin app, and the Merlin app was created by Cornell Ornithology, and it's a free app that you can download on your phone. You just have to make sure you have enough space on your phone. You can either download by region or download by continent. So that gives you different options and you pull up the picture of the bird. It'll give you different facts of the bird. It'll show you pictures of what the female versus the male looks like or the juvenile versus the adult and the different calls and songs. I use it quite often. Um, and this, I, I actually recommend the Berlin app once you're used to what birds you're looking at, just as kind of a refresher because it doesn't really give you say an index or a key on how to go and look up that bird. So if you're a beginning birder, I would recommend a guidebook instead. So you can find various guidebooks out there at different bookstores. We have them at our Lura Share gift store operated by the Star Rock Foundation at the visitor center. You can find them on Amazon, virtually everywhere and anywhere. And there's just one pictured here. This is the Stokes Field Guide to Birds of North America. I have the Peterson Guide and I, I enjoy it, but to each their own. Some folks like the National Geographic Bird Guide. So I would recommend going to a bookstore and leafing through a few of them to see which one is gonna suit you. And then I use this website quite a bit, the Cornell University Lab of Ornithology. I go to this website quite often as well. All right, some of the resources I used for this presentation. And then again, I'm a master naturalist. So if you want to learn more about all the programs offered through the University of Illinois Extension, please visit the website listed here, https colon backslash backslash extension.illinois.edu backslash. Also master gardener program and how to volunteer through that. The same website address, except at the end at that backslash MG for Master Naturalist Program, after that backslash MN, or you can visit the Bureau LaSalle Marshall and Putnam Unit webpage at that same address, backslash BLMP. And I'll wait a second if you wanna write any of that down. We will include all of this on the LaSalle Library website. 
along with the recording of this program, Lisa. So we will have okay. it there again. But thank you for sharing that. It's always important and great resources. Okay, I'll open it up for questions if anyone has any questions for me. We actually do have some things in the chat. We asked folks to let us know what birds they were already seeing in their yards. And, and um, Liza said that she sees lots of those silly grackles and purple finches, robins, cardinals, and a couple of different woodpeckers. And they just saw their first blue jay of the season. Bonnie said the finches in her yard prefer the sunflower seeds to the niger seeds. Oh, we've experienced that too, um, although we have both. Um, also that I uh, saw tons of turkey vultures in Utica this weekend. Um, we've seen them occasionally out uh, along the roadway, but I haven't seen any uh, in the brush. Um, Scott says that he saw a huge owl this morning, the size of an eagle in a tree across from LaSalle Canyon parking lot. Any guesses? Your thoughts on that? LaSalle Canyon parking lot, did it have what looked like ears? Scott, if you're there, you can post in the chat. We can pass that on. Yeah. If it oh, here we like go. It, it looks it like looked, Scott also has another um, comment in the meantime. Any advice if we are traveling to different states this summer and want to do a little birding? Yes, I would get that Merlin app on your smartphone. And when you purchase a bird guide, make sure you're purchasing a bird guide for North America, not just your region of the Midwest and that will help you. What I usually do when I'm traveling is I just do a search for, just type in a Google search, best birding spots in Texas. Say you're going to Texas or look up different wildlife preserves or wildlife refuge, refuges in the area. Um, that's what I usually do. And then a good rule of thumb that I stick to is I look for areas next to water and those areas, whether it's a neighborhood park, a community park, or a state park, you're, you're gonna be able to find some bird species. And then just keep your eyes open. There's been times that I've been traveling that I've just been sitting waiting in the vehicle and all of a sudden I look out and I'm like, oh, that's a scissor tail flycatcher. Never seen one of those before. And that was literally just waiting in line to board the ferry to Port Aransas in Texas. So you just never know what you're gonna see. Okay, it looks like Scott couldn't tell if there were ears on that owl. Um, if, did, if he's regarding it to the size of an eagle, that tells me it's most likely a great horned owl. So great horned owls will, will show more of a square instead of a round head and they'll, their feathers, they're not actually ears, their feathers look like little ear tufts that come out. Um, and also I'm thinking it's a great horned owl because, because just the overall size. We have had barred owls, great horned owls, and screech owls all present at the park. And we've actually had short-eared owls and long-eared long owls present in the fields, basically further south across from Matheson or at the Matheson Vermilion River area. Okay, everybody go out to Star Rock and start looking. Um, <laughs> Lisa, do you lead birding hikes at Starve Rock? And I also, I'm going to throw this in there. I think I saw something come through that there were wildflower hikes, uh, socially distanced and limited in number at the park. Are those yours also? Yes. So I'm the only interpreter at the park. And one of the benefits of COVID, I know we don't really think of COVID having any benefits in our world because everything that's happened. But from my perspective, one of the benefits was that I was able to get out and do more hikes because that's supposed to be a big part of my job, like 90% of my job is outdoor education. But with 3 million visitors a year, when the visitor center is open, I'm usually stuck in the visitor center behind the front desk. So this past year has been a little bit different and I've been playing it month by month. And those hikes have been pre-registered only on Eventbrite. 
to keep the numbers small. So the last guided tours were this past weekend because this coming weekend is our special event weekend, which is the annual wildflower pilgrimage, but I've renamed it wildflower walks with a naturalist because not too many folks identify with pilgrimage anymore. And we are full. I did have 10 cancellations. And so I posted on Facebook and literally within hours, those 10 cancellations were already filled up. Um, but I mean, you can enjoy the wildflowers on your own. The, the trails are open from 7 a.m. until dusk. And you can actually download another free app on your phone called Illinois Wildflowers. And that's a great resource for also looking up plants. There's also several other apps out there where you just take a picture of the plant and it'll give you an ID or a guesstimate that will kind of lead you in the right direction. Okay. Um, I don't, oh, I'm sorry. You had asked a question about bird hikes. I tried doing bird hikes a couple of years ago and they just weren't very popular. I think I had four people sign up for one and then three people for another. And they started, I don't know if it, was, it wasn't popular because they started so early in the morning. We started at seven or if it just wasn't up everyone's alley. But we do have binoculars at the park that are available for rent. You just have to leave your driver's license and have them back by 3.30 but we can't release them just yet because of COVID. So once COVID is lifted, those items will be up for loan again. Well, regarding that, if we do have people in the audience interested in pursuing a bird hike at the park with Lisa, uh, why don't you contact us at the library and we'll make a list and we'll pass it on to you, Lisa. And at some point, maybe we can put together a hike. Yeah, yeah, that would be great. So that would be one thing. Okay, I have two more questions on here and then I have one of my own. Okay. Um, Tiffany says that she read peanut butter on a pine cone attracts birds. Any thoughts about that? So that's gonna basically be like a protein source, like a do-it-yourself suet cake. So yeah, you can do that. Um, people have also drilled larger holes into pieces of wood and then hung the pieces of wood on their trees and smeared either peanut butter or made homemade suet. And you can find just different recipes for that on Pinterest or even just typing in peanut butter feeders on your um, internet search on your computer. Okay, and Liza says that uh, if she puts out grape jelly, will birds not eat all of my grapes this year? And I would like to ask on that, that I had seen something about grape jelly having to be organic because the preservatives in just regular grape jelly, you know, low end brand um, might be harmful to the birds. Um, I haven't read the part with the preservatives, but I have read that the sugar content might be too much as opposed to the nutritional value. So my husband likes to put out the grape jelly. I put out the oranges. I prefer more oranges for the Orioles. Okay. Um, and there's no telling whether or not those grapes, the grape crop is going to be saved either. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have to share. Um, I have a question um, before we close for tonight. I have a, a patch, pasture, about three acres that we kind of just let go. The horses don't go out there. And the crab apple trees, you know, have just been on their own and they're just doing so well. Um, we just have a whole pasture of crab apple trees. What should I, I, mean, I saw the, the uh, meadow lark and I got all excited that possibly with the uh, big trees, deciduous trees back by the creek and this whole three acres of crab apple trees just going crazy and an unmowed area, I might get those metal larks. What else could I expect back there and what can I do to encourage it? Well, do you have a source of water nearby as well? Well, there's a, a moving creek back there, which, you know, during, you know, not drought weather will be running. And um, we put out our many bird baths uh, up closer to the house. So I would say the house water is probably 
oh, 1,500 feet away from the crab apple trees. And then the creek is probably oh, 400 feet away. Well, I think, I think you have enough going on back there that I think you, if you took several hikes back there with binoculars this May, you might be surprised at what species you're attracting in that area. Um, I would think that you would have some brown thrashers, some of, you might even have one or two of the Eastern meadowlarks. Their numbers, I don't see too many of them anymore. Um, just a lot of that food chain and pesticides coming up the ladder. Probably you said you had some evergreens in the back. Yes. You're probably gonna have some of those finches in the area as well. And is there any other tree species besides the crab apple? Well, there's just tons of crab apple back there. We have cedars that have just taken root back there. We have mature cedars that go along the west side of the property as a windbreak, so there's that. And then in the back, we have those hideous uh, white locust trees. Mm -hmm. and um, but there's plenty of leaves on them and, and I see birds in them all the time. So um, that's what's back there. I, um, would, uh, I would definitely say the finches. Um, I, I would think you might, with all those evergreens, you might have a warbler or two in the spring, especially if you have water nearby. And trying to think what else you might have. With that open pasture and the woodland edge, you might have a bluebird. And to attract bluebirds further in, you can put up bluebird boxes and you can find instructions online for that because they're pretty particular. They have to, the boxes like to, they want them to face northeast. Okay. And um, you want to make sure you put a predator guard on it so snakes and stuff can't crawl up and get into the nest. Okay. And then to entice the bluebirds, you can help them out. I mean, they're insectivores, they can find food on their own, but you can put mealworms out. All right. Okay. Well, and then I'd say woodpeckers with those evergreens, especially that sap sucker, if you've got those arbivites in the back or the mm -hmm. Thuja occidentalis, the eastern red cedar. I took advantage of that sale that um, I don't know if it was through the extension office, but the, they just put the order in for trees and shrubs last oh, week yeah. of the delivery is this week in Ottawa. Um, and I, in addition to some seedlings for Norway spruce that I'm hoping will grow quickly and be nice cover for wildlife, um, I, I bought many, many chokeberry bushes. So I'm hoping that also provide something for the birds. I think that we are really running late, aren't we? Um, <laughs> I, this has been so fascinating. Thank you so much for doing this, Lisa. You are more than welcome. Thank you, everybody, for hanging in there with me. This has been great. And I know that uh, we do have another program coming up, and that will be up on the, on the schedule soon. Um, so with that, I think that since we, I think that's all of the, the questions, yes. So with that, I think I will um, conclude for tonight. Thank you again, and um, everybody, happy birding take pictures, post them uh, on Facebook and tag the library so that we can send them on to Lisa too and, um, or send them to the library if not on Facebook and uh, we'll make sure that they get posted. So thanks again for sharing your evening with us. Lisa, thank you again, always fascinating. Thanks and, everybody. Um, we'll see you soon. Good night. Bye.